All right, let me tell you quickly about who I am. I um, started as a journalist writing about science and biotechnology, and then ended up starting what is called GenSpace, which is the world's first community biology lab. So way back when, eight years ago, some of you have heard the story, I apologize. Uh, way back uh, eight years ago, um, as a journalist, I was reporting on all these uh, fantastic discoveries in biotechnology and found myself deeply jealous of the scientists who were doing these experiments because I wanted to see how it actually worked myself. I wanted to try the science myself. And as someone with a degree in English literature, um, that meant I was going nowhere near their labs. Uh, so I had a decision. Either I could go back and start undergraduate from day one uh, and then go to graduate school and then go and get a PhD and then, uh, you know, get a grant and start my own lab uh, and then, t you know, so that would take about 10 years uh, and then start my first experiment. I could otherwise try to do it uh, in my house. And so what you're looking at is a picture from eight years ago in my uh, apartment in Park Slope. This is our living room. Um, we turned the living room table into a lab bench, uh, basically covered it with a tarp. We ordered some basic reagents and some bacteria online. And, uh, and we did our first experiment. The first experiment that we did as GenSpace was genetically engineer an E. coli bacteria to glow green. So we inserted a green, it's called a green fluorescent protein uh, gene from a jellyfish into the E. coli and uh, grew the E. coli up. Surprisingly, we didn't have an incubator. Uh, so what we had to do, and we will never do this again, is we took the Petri dish of the uh, engineered E. coli and someone taped it under their armpit <laughs> slept overnight with this E. coli under their armpit, and voila, we actually got genetic engineering to work in a, in a living room in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> of course, a brilliant start to a brilliant career, right? Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it proved to us that we could do biotech in an unconventional setting, outside of your, uh, your, your corporate lab or your industrial lab, and certainly outside of your academic lab. And it meant to us that uh, biotechnology, the, the barriers to biotechnology were, were, were lowering and that we might be able to actually do real science in a really unconventional way. Uh, so people started meeting in my house uh, once every other week to try other experiments, and very quickly we learned that my roommates weren't going to like that, and that there's only so much you can do uh, in, that, in, in, in three hours every other week. And so we moved eventually, uh, after a year of hunting, we moved to a place uh, on 33 Flatbush in Brooklyn in a really unconventional art space, uh, and, we, and they allowed us to set up a biology lab. So that's, that's it. And, and what we realized as we went into that um, new facility, if you can even call it that, uh, was that we were joining a much larger movement in biotechnology, which was really about, one, making uh, the technology, making biotech much more powerful uh, in terms of engineering organisms and, and the world and environment and the ecosystems around us, but also making it more ubiquitous. And we were sort of the uh, tip of the spear in making it more ubiquitous, certainly. Um, we started that eight years ago, called it GenSpace. Other people saw that we could do it. Today, there are 95 different groups around the world who are taking biotechnology outside of your traditional labs. Here's our lab. Um, it is very much a platform for the people who come to us. Our, our mission is that anyone can do biotechnology. Uh, given that they have the mentorship and the tools and obviously the safety training to do it. Um, for me personally, when I came here, uh, Data and Society became kind of a platform for me to, uh, to evaluate what we had been doing for the last eight years, to really think about, well, what, what have we done? How does it fit into society? 
and what does it actually what does it actually mean? Um, and well, I'm going to show you a couple of ways in which we try to explore that. Uh, so we created something called oh, it's cut off a little bit, but it's called the Biotech Futures uh, Talk and Lecture uh, Lab Series. And the idea was that we were going to have talks here in Data Society for audiences like you among leaders in, uh, leaders and among people who are really questioning what it means for biotech uh, to infiltrate society in the way it, which it's doing. And so the first uh, talk we did was with ha Heather Dewey Hagborg. It was a privacy in the era of personally genomics talk and I'll, I'll give you a little details on that. The talk was followed up by a lab actually at our space uh, in GenSpace where people who um, learned about what was happening on stage went actually back to our lab and, and, and tried it for themselves. And so there were a couple of lessons from that. So let, let me just quickly show you who uh, our first speakers were. This is Jason Bobe. He's uh, one of the founders of DIYBio.org and also uh, from Mount Sinai. This is Sophie Zier. She's at the New York Genome Center. And here's Heather Dewey Hagborg, who's actually a fellow this year as well, and an artist who's been really thinking about the social implications of um, genomics. Um, Interestingly, genomics is, is a place where data science and biology really m mesh. The, you know, the soft, wet, gushy stuff, the liquid of, of, of working with vials suddenly matches with uh, the, uh, the actual ones and zeros of, of, bio, of, of, uh, of computer science and uh, data analysis. Um, and something that happened when they were doing their workshop, so Sophie and, uh, and Heather did a workshop at, at GenSpace where they were exploring what you can learn from your genome um, simply about your, your history uh, or your, your, your background or, or your parents' background. Um, and there was a really interesting issue that they both were arguing about in front of the students. So here were two, two a scientist and an artist arguing about basically what does it actually mean when you get your genomic data? What does it actually say about your, your background as a human being? Um, the issue was over literally a, a data point that pointed to different areas on the map of Europe of where people, where the, where the person's background was from. And if you examine the data in one way, that person was a certain percentage from the UK. And if you analyze that data another way, they were simply from another area in Northern Europe. Um, and so for Heather, that meant that the data was Bullshit. I mean, that, that was the language she, she used. And for Sophie, that was, well, this is, a, this is, this is the, an error in interpretation. And so what I started to understand here was that it was a matter of how you privilege the information, how you privilege what you are receiving. So Heather was privileging uh, personal histories, uh, what you know about your family. Uh, and, and Sophie was privileging the data that you find in your DNA. And I don't think they ever reconciled that. Um, here's the second talk. Uh, we were exploring synthetic biology. Synthetic biology, programming life with DNA. Um, this was the second one. And synthetic biology is also about the question of how you turn biological wet stuff into um, how you turn this wet stuff into basically a data science, how you, how you basically program life. And so the two people who are speaking, this was amazing, this was, this was foundational for me. These are two of my heroes got to come here and that, I think that I, I owed Data and Society a huge debt for that. Uh, this is Tom Knight, who's basically the pioneer of synthetic biology, and Christina Agapakis, who works with him, who is, um, the, one of the first bio designers who's thinking about um, biology as a design medium. Um, and they were talking about the complexity of, of basically programming life. So what does genetic engineering look like when you start to think of uh, genes as individual modules that you can snap together just like 
programming code. And there were two perspectives there. Tom was trying to simplify things so that literally you could mix and match genes to make your organism do exactly what you want. And Christina Agapakis was saying, well, you know, life is extremely complicated to get organisms to act on these simple, what you're looking as a, a, at as a circuit, uh, is, is far more complicated. Um, and really what we came to at the end of that conversation was that there's a synthesis of the two, that the only way that biotechnology is going to go forward is where you take the complexity of the, bio, of the biotechnology, you try to apply some of this human engineering to it, and then you sort of mix the two. So you're actually melding uh, evolution, or sort of a directed evolution, and this sort of human engineering. Um, it was, I, I, I mean, having been here and, and, and exploring it, I think it was really transformative for me. And so uh, again, I'm, I'm thankful to the folks here. Um, going forward, we're gonna do a third one uh, at the, after the end of the summer, where we start to explore how automation fits into this whole uh, world. So uh, stay tuned, there's more to come. Um, and I hope I'll see you all there. Thank you very much. <laughs>